it's like a coder or who, who, who creates these um programs for the companies that they can buy or sometimes they buy them off from offshore you know like from india china ukraine <laughs> it's cheaper sometimes they um they have in in-house coder depends on how big or small okay so i am mostly caught up with your grade okay so if you have anything outstanding and you haven't submitted make sure that you get them in to me if for some reason they're locked because you know the the availability has passed shoot me an email and tell me which one okay because i can go in and specifically change those okay so the ones that you need for you um but <clears throat> all else something is better than nothing so make sure that we get them in okay don't wait till the end because i don't take all the late work at the end just Try to send them in as much as possible. All right. I was out of commission yesterday, right? Over the weekend, I was just down with a cold and then, but well, I'm better now. I'm back in business. <laughs> and we were wrapping up a grant, so it's been crazy. Okay, so today, as some of you are coming in, we are going to work on a few things. Um, I know that the chapter talks about troubleshooting drives and things like that. The best way that I can give you this is going to be using command line because there are times that you're going to be in safe mode in command line, meaning that when you fix somebody's system, you need to format their drive or you need to troubleshoot some issues with the driver. So in Windows, you can go into safe mode, right, by using the, the Windows startup menu. So now most of our stuff today is going to be command prompt and PowerShell. Um, I feel like the book and mostly a lot of the instructor that teaches this type of class, they don't give you that. And then when you come into the administration, you can't use the interface and you have to find your ways through command prompt or PowerShell, and it's hard. The industry right now, that's what they're looking for, okay? So if you, you can do everything in command line, right? I love Linux for that fact that you can do everything in command line. Uh, and so mostly for Windows, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing, and, and we are gonna use this utility mostly. We're gonna come back to, to the OS side on the second part of the book, where it talks about you know troubleshooting the the software side. So the first half is about hardware. We have opened the computers a few times. We install everything, all the hardware. Um, so in the book for the second part of the chapter, it just mainly hit on you know how to look for these things. But I wanted to expand on it and and show you a little bit on checklist and. Uh, using this utility, like this part and so on. I know some of you already know this, but it, this might be new material for, for others. So just bear with me, okay? So today you are going to need your USB. If you don't have a USB, I did grab some from my office and you can let me know and I'll give you one. And then I'll put them up here if you want one, you can grab one. All right, I buy them. They're from China, so they're super cheap. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the lab for today. Um, like I mentioned, we are going to work with some of the disk utility. And I put heck this. See that? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the first one is going to be check this. And uh, as you know, right, you've read this part, check this is gonna help you with fixing the errors or correcting the errors on your storage, whether it's gonna be on your flash storage like SSD or on your HDD. So um, 
for the option to do check this, Microsoft has a full documentation on how to use their commands. Okay, so I'm going to click on that and show you real quick. So here, you are going to have to be part of the administrator group to do a lot of the high level internal component configuration. So whenever you run command prompt, try to do it as an administrator. And how you would do that is when you search for command prompt, like CMD, before you click it, you just right click and do run as administrator. Same thing with PowerShell, okay? Um, because you're going to run into issues that certain command will not take because of privilege requirement. So that's good to know. Then um, the parameters when you're using the check this command, most of the time we are going to see slash F. That is in general fix the errors on the disk, okay? But your computer, your Windows system is not going to allow you to fix the disk while it's using the OS, okay, for the OS. So what you can do is you can run this. It's going to scan it and give you the result, and it's going to ask you to schedule it the next time you start up the computer. It's going to check and fix the disk for you, and that's usually the case, okay? So that's what you're going to see today. Now, um, when, you, when you work with Windows, all the modern operating system and in the future chapter, starting with six, you're going to see that it's going to talk about file system. So file system is just a group of file that is formatted a certain way for a certain OS. Um, in Windows environment, you, all the modern ones with the security in mind, we would use NT file system, okay? So new technology file system, that's what Microsoft used. But it also can use FAT. And so when you plug your USB in, you're going to find that the file system that it's using is going to be FAT, which stands for file allocation table. And file allocation table work with all OSs, including Mac OS and Linux, okay? So that's why you have storage drive, external storage drive that uses FAT. Now, FAT allocation table is limited in, in sizes, in how many sections you can create within the drive, logically, we'll talk about that, and so on. So there are certain commands that's only gonna be for a certain file system. So make sure that you, you, you see that and you know that, okay? And then, um, and then if we are working with FAT, there are only a couple because the way that they built this is the legacy system uses file allocation table. All the new modern Windows operating system uses NT file system. And why am I focusing on mostly Windows is because Windows PC have the most problem, okay? And it is mostly used in the business environment. True. Okay, all right. So let's talk about some of the steps. You're gonna plug in your USB. You're gonna search for CMD. And before you click it, you're gonna right click and do run as administrator. And this is gonna take you to your, um, your command prompt. Okay. Then in command prompt, what we're gonna do is we are going to do a check disk only by itself. And you can do a slash F if you wanted to fix it, right? Um, so we would do a check disk and press enter. So C-H-K-D-S-K, that's what we're gonna use. And I hope that you can use this also for your own personal system. So what we're telling it to do is that when you're using this command, it automatically plug in the, the switch or the option slash F, which stands for fix for you, right? But that's not always the case for all the other commands. So in this case, it's that. So what this is doing is it's running a read-only mode and it's examining your drive, your C drive, 
okay? And it's gonna show you the result when it's done. Okay, so this is gonna take a little bit. So while it's going, right? So at the end, you, what you're gonna see is you are going to see the information about your drive. And so why is this important? Most of the time when people bring you the computer, it, it, is, it has problems, right? And for on the storage side, outside of the physical connection or the drive is going bad, we have to really logically see what the issue would be uh, with the drive. And check this is where I normally start when people are having drive issues. Right, and outside of just, you know, we talked about malware and other things and how the system doesn't start and other issues. So it could be that um, the, they have a lot of bad sectors. So what happens is when it's writing to the HDD, the hard disk drive where it's been, um, it creates the section of the disk that is corrupted. So what we will do is we will use a tool an executable to be able to correct those things, right? But it's not always that it's able to correct it 100%. What it will do is it's gonna be able to fix a lot of the errors as if it couldn't write to some of part of the disk, okay? So that's what we would have. Oh, wow, this is taking a little longer than my system, but because it is a larger drive. So keep in mind that when you're doing a terabyte or two terabyte, it's going to be much longer than if you're doing something that's like, you know, 500 gigs or less. Okay. So when we're done with that, you are going to take a screen capture and it's going to give you the information about your C. So in Windows C is going to be your OS drive. Okay. Now, uh, we're only going to have one physical disk or two installed but we can section up that disk into many different logical, what we call a partition. Think of it like your house, right? Your house have many rooms. And so we can take the house and divide up all of these little sections that we can dedicate for other things. So let's say C is like your main living room, right? And then you have other rooms like for storage, right? My house, that will be your garage or your bedroom and so on. So we designed the system to really mimic us. So that's how we implemented these things. So in storage, what we can do is we can cut up the different section and we can apply different operations to those sections. And that's what we call logical disk. okay? So, um, okay, so I need to reach this and it's almost there okay all right so here it is it tells me that it first examined the basic file system structure okay and it verifies everything is complete i have zero bad file records process and it's going to parse through so in an os what it does is it creates right like a list or or a table of all of these files, and it maps those files to a certain addresses on the actual disk. Okay, so when it goes through, that's how it's able to really find your file, right? And so after it process everything, it's gonna give you the, the result. Now on the GUI side, right, this exists in tools. So if you, Legacy-wise, if you go and you go to this PC and you right-click and you go to Properties, um, let's see, takes it System Settings. So go to Advanced System Settings, and then um, let me see if they moved it. It used to be. I might be wrong because Windows 10, they change up the thing compared to seven. So there should be an option where you can actually run it, but then Microsoft might move things around. 
one second. It only does that here. Let me see. Plain storage. Okay. Yeah, then you have to go to storage and then in the storage, you can optimize the drive. We talked about that last time. Um, manage space. So they built the tools into this for Windows 10 and Windows 11. On Windows 7, you can go to the properties of the system and then there should be a tool tab and then you will be able to run that there. Okay. And Windows 7 will soon be obsolete anyway. They're going to stop supporting that. Okay. So as this is running, let's talk about some of the things. So if you read the documentation or you look at this list, you're going to see that if I'm using SDC cleanup, it's the same thing as the slash F. So there are three ways that we can use check this. We can use it with the, the regular check this command. We can use it with the slash F for fix. We can use SDC cleanup or SD cleanup. Okay. And SD in general, in all OSs, that stands for storage disk. So this is why when you see in Linux or, or other, you know, in different Linux releases, it would say SDA0, right, for the first disk. SDA1 for the second logical disk, okay? So there you see. And if you don't know what command to use or what option to use with check this, you just do a help option, which is a slash no question mark. And that goes with all the commands. Okay. So there you would see. Now, you know, we can also monitor the performance. So check this. When we run it, just a regular check this, it doesn't give, it's only a read only, right? It does the scan and it gives us the, the output as result. Um, and so on. Okay. Let's see. I'm still at this. So it's a little more to go when it's parsing for stage two. My laptop was much faster, I guess, because I have a less of a drive. So if you, because on my laptop, I think it's like 250 gig, it's a lot quicker. All right. Um, so you would have the information. So the output for the SD cleanup should be the same as the output for the F because it implied the same command. So we would then, yes. Okay. Now, when it finishes your command, it's going to tell you, you know, it's going to ask you, it's going to prompt you, it's going to say, do you want to schedule this for the next restart? If I hit Y for yes, the next time I reboot my computer, right, it's going to do the check this. Okay. Now, in the case of MVC, they deep freeze all their computers. So all your settings that's in there goes away. Okay. So that's why, you know, it might not even occur in the case that we save the next restart. But if you do that at home, right, it's going to take a few minutes when you restart your computer and then it's going to try to clean everything. And then it's going to show you on the bottom of your screen that. How do I cancel that? How do I cancel that? I, I will, um, yeah, put yes. Yes and no doesn't matter. Right? But, but realistically, <laughs> realistically, we want yes, right? We want that to happen. So we would then restart the computer. We want to fix the problem. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come back to this and let it go. Okay, so another thing that we're going to learn about today is going to be your Windows management instru instrumentation, which is the WMI. And this is a way that we can look at the disk. So there are a few ways on the GUI side. You can go into your PC and you can see, right, your disk here. You can right click and go to disk management and you can see that there as well. 
if you have a privilege to do that, right? So here in this management, it lays out different things for me, right? My, my disk zero, which is my C drive, my storage drive, and my E drive, which is my USB. And it would tell you your, your file system. So in command line, it would do the same thing, right? Um, now, Windows have WMIC. This is what I call WMIC, logical disk, but you have to do the whole deal to get the detail. Because if you only doing like the get device ID, it's only showing you the ID, okay? So you want to get the volume name and the description, okay? So in the case where you have a very sick computer that somebody give you, right? And you boot it up to go to, uh, you know, your, your command line in safe mode, you can simply check to see how the drives are doing. Okay, by using that. So when you look at your drive, you should see that it's gonna label OS for your C drive, okay? When you use that command, because how do I know? Well, if you look on the GUI side, right? This is an active drive and active drive is storing your operating system. Now, differently in Linux and Mac OS, of course, but Windows, it's only going to use the C drive by default, okay, unless you mount the drive with a different drive letter. And on here, it also tells me that's where my Windows OS is, C, okay? So that's equivalent to your root drive on, on the other OSs. Um, and then for your USB, it would also default to giving it a different drive letter here. So how does it give it a D? I didn't give it a D. When you plug it in, whichever the letter comes next after the drive that you have, that's what it's going to give you. Okay. So can I, can I reassign this? Sure. Okay. See how if you right click it and you can change your drive letter. You can assign it anything you want. So in the network environment, I'm gonna tell you this. A lot of the times we mount network drive, which exists in a server for all the system, right? So basically we create a folder, we link that folder to the drive. So the user can throw stuff in that folder and it automatically saves it to, to our network storage. So that way people don't have to navigate to a server that's like, you know, through, the network because people get confused and then they put it in the wrong location. So we would assign, we would change the letter drive, like we would make it like drive Z or drive N, and then we would mount it to a folder and be able to do that. And you will be able to do that after you, you know, throughout this class in the, in the next few weeks. I'll show you how you can do that. Okay. So you can mount, you can mount a, a, a network drive to that. Now, if you want to format your drive, you can choose format, right? You can also do this part format and so on. But formatting means that it's going to take whatever you have and it's going to rewrite the file system on top of it so all your data will go away, right? So, and I can use a different file system when I format. Did yours get finished, everyone? Yeah. I'm yeah. still going. How slow is my system right now? <laughs> okay, so let's try to answer some of the questions. So we know that the volume name is going to be an OS. Okay. And then uh, the drive letter, I have drive E. That's just the next letter after the other two, okay? And I mentioned this before, why is it not A or B? Originally, traditionally, that was used for what? Floppy drive, right? So that's why C is for your hard drive, for your OS, and then anything subsequent will be added. So if you have a, a, a CD burner or DVD burner or Blu-ray, it will be a D drive, right? Or an E drive and so on. 
Can you have lots and lots of drive? Yes, you can. And then we'll talk about like the way that we set up our disk, the type of disk, and in Windows environment, what's the limitation with NVR and TPT and all of that down the line. Okay, that's part of, of one of the harder area of either Microsoft certification or the CompTIA ones. Okay, so, and I should have used my laptop for this. Okay. Then you can also scan your, you can do a checklist on your, on your external drive. Okay. So your USB should be fairly quick because it's really small. <laughs> I wonder. All right, let's do another one. So I'm going to use another command this time. Okay, so we can, um, while it's doing that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this command. Take out the colon there. It's not like that. Okay, so this is your W mic, right? And so what that does is it's gonna give you if you do only the get name, it's only gonna give you the drive letter. Okay. So if you want to add, so how many drives do I have listed? On this one, I have three. C, D, and E. And then if I do this command with the logical disk, I will get a little bit more details, right? So here, oh, they label this window. So your storage is gonna be D and then that's the volume name. So let me fix that. Okay. So why did I show this here? Well, before you check your disk, you wanna know what disk you have, right? And you can simply use WMIC or the Windows uh, management instrumentation tool to be able to do that. And then I'm gonna now do the check disk E slash F. So you just simply do check this and then the drive letter and to fix it, right? Oh, sorry. I just type there. Just type that right. Check this out. Let's see. There we go. I think the only uh, command I've ever used to like uh, work with drives on the command prompt is uh, this list, and then I just fix it from there. Because yeah. I had it happen to me once where my uh, my flash drive just like got corrupted or something, mm -hmm. so I had to fix it like that. Yeah, you can do it that way too. Um, so flash drives are bound to to have those type of things, right? Like when you plug it in and there's no more light, sometimes that could be your USB port, okay? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, you can you can definitely go through and you can, you can find your files and things this way. There are a lot of recovery tools too that use this only command line. So you can actually pull your file. Okay, so when it scans, definitely faster, right? You saw? So it has four kilobyte, one hidden files. Guess what file it is? What file do you think that is? What file do you think that is that's hidden? You can't see it when you open your USB. What do you think that is? Your firmware. How does it know, right? 
that's a data ocean drive or a, a Western digital drive. That's I, thought it, a, I thought it keeps it on the chip or something. <laughs> uh, that also, but on the software level, you still have to have that running in the back. If you don't believe me, right, if you have external hard drive or um, larger drive, when you plug it in, you can actually, there's a folder that they have that. So in the past, it's more visible. All right, that the system is gonna use that to be able to recognize what kind of drive it is, or you know, storage brand and 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 you know the USB versions and all of that. Okay, like three point one, etc. And then I have seven files on the USB, so yours might be different as you have different amount of files. Okay, and then it tells me that I have about close a little bit more than 15.5 so 15.3 gigs that's available on the 16 gigs drive and here are the allocation unit so what that does is it's going to section that into group uh, like individual unit and so whenever it writes the file it's going to use this unit and it's going to increment the unit to write the actual file okay I think a lot of the students that are learning programming can definitely benefit from taking a class like this because it really helps you understand how the computer works, right? How things are written so that way when you when you program, you would see that how it's storing. Okay. So then on on here it tells me that this is the amount of units that's going to be on that specific drive. And so on a larger drive, you're going to see that there are more units. Right. So just think about it like like this, like you have an egg carton and every hole holds an egg. Right. So here is an egg and then you have this many holes for the egg on the carton. OK. So how many files are stored on the drive on mine? I have seven. OK. What's the space used? Um, for my view space, so I have this available. So four kilobytes. So this is going to be the space: a thousand three hundred and twenty-four kilobytes. Very small. And yours is going to be a little different. Okay. Any questions regarding uh, using your external uh, USB? So Moises said that he uses this list. There are other commands that we can use to look at the disk and fix the disk. So we would use what's called a disk part. So when you call up this part, what it does is it's gonna bring in a tool for, it's a partitioning tool, okay? And this, it's gonna take it into the actual tool itself. So when you do this, Basically, it runs an executable. So here is where we can start adding in different commands for that particular tool. So for example, I wanted to see how many logical partitions, like how many rooms in my house, right? How many rooms, how many partitions is in, um, is, is for my disk. If you just do a list volume, and this is a little bit more clear than what you've seen in the other tool. So it tells me that volume zero, volume one and two, and C is gonna be at volume zero. So this is exactly like what we would see in here. Look at that, right? This zero, this one, and this two. Okay. So let's answer the questions. How many volumes are listed? I have three. Again, what size of your system volume? So 
So here's your system volume. So 476 gigabyte. So in order to exit, we have to exit twice, but this part has a lot of different additional options. I put the link here for you. So in case you wanted to learn what those are, right, you can go to that. So if I use active, it's gonna mark that drive active. What do I mean by that? The active drive is the bootable OS drive. So if you want to make it an active drive, Right, so you just say active C, that's gonna allow you to mark that C drive active, okay? Um, and then other options such as you can add, which is where you mirror a simple volume. So when do we do this? We do this when we do backup. When you do mirroring is when you do like RAID or backup. So I simply copy when I mirror. So when you mirror the volume, you just duplicate that volume to another section or another disk, okay? And so on. So they do have a clean option. This tells you that it removes all the partition volume formatted from the disk with the focus. So this is not the, the fix and the cleanup that you see. This actually wipes out all the volume that you tell it to, to clean. Okay, so be careful with that. Then you can also create a partition. So in, in the, on the GUI side, how can you create? Let's say that I have more storage here, right? On, on my drive, like unpartitioned, that means it's not used. Think of your house, like there's that one location that it's just empty. There's nothing use, there's no use for it. So on the unpartitioned or the unallocated partition, you can right click it and you can make a volume out of it, like some, some use for it and you can format it. So my analogy for this is when you, when you cut up a partition for the disk, it does not mean that it's usable yet, okay? Until you format it. So in the house, when you section that room, it's not livable yet until you do what? You put carpet, flooring, paint, all of that furniture in, and then you live there, right? So that means that when we format it, we get it prepared so that way we can put in the file that would use, that would utilize the file system to be able to store or uh, place inside that partition. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, or you don't have to get a used laptop. If you have your laptop, you can add in a drive and then be able to do that, right? Okay. So when I'm done, I simply exit. This takes me back to the actual command prompt, right? Like I get out of that tool. Um, so now, I want to use PowerShell inside command prompt because in the past, we know that we can run PowerShell by searching for PowerShell. What if you cannot search for PowerShell, right? So when I wrote this, I thought my student can, any executable, you can run it through command line, okay? So you just call up PowerShell.exe yeah. because Microsoft uses exe. The only time that you see that it's not uh, using exe is that if it's like installation, which uses MSI for setup, okay? So here we are in PowerShell mode. You see how the PS is in the front? And when you open up regular PowerShell, it's still gonna tell you the root directory, which is your C and then your user and MVC and so on, whichever user that you use, okay? So now you're in the PowerShell mode. Now I wanted to, um, Sorry, I had a typo there. Um, I wanted to be able to get information about my, my system, my file system, okay? So PowerShell commands are a little bit more uh, software oriented, right? If you take C++ or programming class, we teach you that 
you would set and get, okay? You do functions to set and you do function to get. So the way that they, they make PowerShell is really to work with shell scripts and, you know, programming languages. So that's why you see the, the commands are a little different. So here, I'm getting something similar to what I've seen up here, right? I also can find my drives this way. It also tells me the used, okay? And then also the free, that means that's the available space, and then based on the file system. Now, the, the, the drive letters are listed there, and then it gives you the slash for the root path and so on. Okay, so that's another way that you can find your information. Okay, and then on the far right, you would see more details over here. Okay, so uh, the space use for this, sorry, I'm going to look uh, 180 gigs for the C and the free. So 180 gigs on mine. How much space is free on your USB? It tells me 14.62. Yours is a little different. That's okay. Okay, so I wanted also to take this opportunity since we're in PowerShell to show you how to look at registry. And some of you probably already know how to use RegEdit. That's a way that you can use the editor for registry to, which is what's noted here, right? To clean up some stuff like if, you know, for applications. So anytime that you install applications, anytime you modify, your your system configuration windows system it puts it into these files that stored as a database called the registry okay and we will further explore this also in the future week so take out the call copy that with it So here, what it tells me is that I have, right, these two registry that stores, there are directory and they have these files in there that store information about my system. There are more to this, right? There are ways that you can access it on the GUI side as well. But in, cyber, in security for forensic, we sometimes look at registry because people are pretty sneaky, right? Like they can wipe out a drive that they were using instantly, because that's easy. I can just try to format it. Even sometime when you format it, some software can still find some, some stuff, especially when it's flashed, because flash until it's written over, it's still there, right? Like that's why you don't throw away your micro SD, okay? Because even though your system says that, oh, you know, you reset it, your data is still there. Anyway, so we can look, go into the registry to see what they've done recently, especially when, you know, when you're investigating cases where, you know, they, they modify some stuff, they deleted files, everything is logged on the system. Unless they are very thorough and they know how forensic works is when they clean up really well. Um, we can also use- Can you use events like the web view or- yeah, but event viewer only logs, it depends on what you set it to log, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you set it to log things that are outstanding, it will only log that. But on the this side, you know, Linux side, we can use a thing called DD and, and we can also look into the actual file even when they started deleting stuff. How is, uh, like, how is the uh, information stored as in, when I was reading the book, they were giving uh, the CDs as an example, so you know how back in the days you would uh put something on the on the CD, and then you could you would be able to like rewrite uh, rewrite over it. But they were giving an example of a laser pointer to it. Yeah. 
so so on the HDD, it what think of it like little pieces of pie. So it has these sector, right? And it writes to the sector. That's why when you look at the the information earlier, it will say bad sector or not. And each sector has a certain size. They're like units. So it would write to the section of the drive on the HDD. On the flash technology, think of them as like cell base where it would store into the actual physical, it writes directly into that. But all, all storage and all type of storage, including RAM, it has to map it somehow back to the address, okay? So when you, when you write your homework, so for example, like your lab file in Word document, it's not in one location. It's actually scattered, it's spread across. Doesn't matter, especially for HDD. So when you open up the application and pull up that file, it maps it back to all of these locations and it's able to pull the file back together, okay? So, you know, so it brings it back together. And for the flash technology, it's quicker because it's in that one location that's able to pull it. That's why on the SDD side, it's much faster access compared to going to different section of the disk and then gather all of that up, okay? So that's why, and so keep in mind that like all of your disk information, all of the application, all the things that you do, Microsoft tracks it that way. It keeps track of it through this. So how does it know when you install an application? Well, through the registry, okay? And sometimes when you have, registry issues you have to go in and fix the problem in the registry and that's a little bit more complicated on the os side right you would get a registry error message it's in it, it would show like a little red stop sign and that would be uh, that then you have to go and find that location and see why it's like that how do you put like a million songs on the usb and like i think like hmm. It transferred to like it transferred to sound. It, it's on like a little hard drive. I don't know. It's, it's, so all your data is digitized, it's just right? Ones and zeros. So mm -hmm. everything is in binary. Mm -hmm. But you, when you when you listen to your song, remember you're using the software. Yeah, but it right? translates all the yeah. Like so it it in, it <laughs> encodes and decodes. Yeah. So yeah. what it does, it converts it, and it has to what they call encapsulate it. So either it digitize it or, or, or convert it back to analog. What you hear in sound is in an analog signal. What it saves is in the digital, which is zero and ones. Yeah. So the software does the conversion for you. Okay. So any questions as far as PowerShell? Okay, no? I know we've done a lot of like the, the display configuration before, but I wanted to just show you, especially when people complain about their HD video, right? Um, you know, now when you're connecting multiple monitor, you have to configure stuff for multiple, multiple monitor, right? And the way that you would do that is in settings. And then you go to display. So if you have multiple monitor, I see people struggle with this all the time. They bring the laptop in for projection, yeah. right? And then they can't, they don't select this to show which screen that they're on. So it does the projection doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, so when you know when you connect to projection, you also need to make sure that the system identify which screen that you're trying to also project. But Microsoft has implemented an options where you can set it for projection okay so here what i had done was um you are going to click on display and then under the hd color you are going to click on hd color settings and then you are it's going to give you the the capability where is i in here right here click that and then it's going to tell you, okay? So this is something that's on more of the newer system. You don't see this when it's older, of course, right? And with the newer OS as well. Okay, so 
list the display capability. Oh. I remember I had to turn that off because like I had it turned on for HDR or something mm -hmm. and it just made the colors look right out. and it was like oh why is this so, so bad? your system resolved based on what the the os is designed to resolve based on what it's seen as what the driver and the devices would need right and in the case where you know if you for the the resolution for the hd if you using certain type of apps that require it what does this do you know there are some apps that they don't scale for the actual screen you see that yeah. you ever go to use an app on your phone and it doesn't scale to your phone and it's super annoying or it has like the, black bars yeah black oh. bars or like the prints are really small right because the developers they don't scale it for the device it, that's additional <laughs> programming that they have to do right yeah so on the low end if they pay for minimal programming that's what they're gonna get so <laughs> yeah so you have to configure your settings to scale to the app not the app to the system so keep that in mind for those of you who are working in development Why do you think right? there's more app developers for ios than android because there's multiple androids like with different screen sizes and then iphones are more or less like they're the same so it really doesn't matter and also the tools for i for app app development with the iphone is different Right, yeah, and using like Swift with X framework, something. we are going to have a certificate on that. I'm going to pitch it next Wednesday to the advisory committee. I'm going to write first the non certificate, non credit. But, anyways, so here is where you configure the app you know, the, the display for the app, right? Like we would configure the device to the app. That should be the other way around, however, okay. So, so we would do stream use and use uh, WCG apps. So we let's note that. Stream HDR use HDR and uh, what is that? WCG app, right? So here it sets to no, okay? And then you can also have like video playback. All right, so now yeah, on the video not... playback settings, we're gonna look at that <laughs> as we live in the, in or more of like the multimedia world all the time, right? Like that's how we connect is through multimedia, okay? So on here, what you would see is for the video playback setting, is the system set to automatically process the video or enhance it? What setting can you select to reduce the bandwidth? So if you read this right here, is it on or off? It's off, right? Yeah. So we can say no, it doesn't automatically process video to enhance it. Because if it does, if you set this to on, it does take a little longer to process that. Okay. And then it depends on also your adapter. So these Alienware is fully capable of that because it does have a pretty nice GPU. However, on the lower end system, you you want you want to keep it off for most part. Okay. So we can I heard say the esports they turn off like all the like picture settings that like cause the monitor or the graphics card to like process more because of the milliseconds that they yeah. get. I was like, that's crazy. Really? They turn it all off? <laughs> so I I was talking to my class uh yes oh no. Uh was it Monday? Yeah, Monday about because they're doing uh parallel programming, meaning that you can have all the cores executing the function at the same time compared to sequential programming like what you run in, when you build a program it runs top down that's sequential right yeah so it execute one function at a time and in graphic development that's what it uses it uses parallel so all the g because the 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 graphic processor unit has thousands of little sub processor and that's how it's able to do like 3d rendering really well is that it, it concurrently doing all of that at once and the developer 
that you know on the hardware level and on the software level they they build parallel programming into that so um we were talking about converting 2d to 3d and how that would be using the gpu so gpu is always going to be slower than your cpu okay at the clock rate and so even when it's it's executing at the same time it's still going to be slower than your computer clock okay doesn't matter how much you pay for your gpu thousands of dollars but you know what your i7 and i9 and your your ryzen is always going to be faster that and also they don't have as many cores in cpu side notes all right what setting to reduce bandwidth so go back here it tells you that um to stream video right for you would set it to lower resolution so that's how we would know right like if if you have lower resolution of course it's going to take less bandwidth sd compared to hd on youtube right if you run if you watch an hd video it's going to consume more bandwidth compared to SD. So now you know on your phone when you have that cap on your data, then watch the SD video. It's not as clear, however. Okay. I mean, compression can help that too. Like it, it compresses like the data. Yes, but you have that's if you download and compress the video. Okay. Or you but can YouTube, also convert it to a different format, yeah. which does the compression. YouTube's compression is kind of. Yeah, I struggle with that every day. <laughs> and that I, I send it up, and especially when I have yeah, a very high good. resolution, it does take a long, long time for yeah. them to convert it. Okay, um, to improve, oh, yeah, on the laptop, I don't, I don't think you see that on here. If you also use a, a compression, like what Moises said, that's going to also reduce your battery life. So low resolution and compressed video. I wrote the lab on my laptop. So when you use a laptop, you would see that option compared to uh, on the desktop, you don't see that option. Okay, lastly, for the printer sharing, I wanted to add this because there is a section in the book that talks about how to troubleshoot printer. I did have a bunch of broken printer in my garage, but then I was sick the last couple of days, so I didn't have time to clean it up for you guys. So hopefully, Maybe in the future, I'll bring it in. So um, fixing printer is one of like the common thing that most technicians have to deal with. Um, and so simply printers. things like this, I'm gonna show you. A lot of times you're gonna get printers like this. Okay, this one. Okay, this one right here. Okay, so you're gonna open this up and you are going to see. So this one, right? Uh, I brought you. You're going to have a tray where you can see the paper in. A lot of times, common things like paper thin. You already know that, right? Like the rollers get stopped because they're dirty. And when you use a laser printer, the little particles, they they build up over time. So one of the best tools that you can bring with you to use a printer is a small vacuum cleaner. Okay. When you open this up, you also see it. It has like these little film-like black residue that comes from not the dust, but it's from processing the print. And then on this one, a lot of them, they either lift up or they pull out from the front. So on the very large HP laser printer, you are going to have to lift up when you press that button and it's going to move up. So this comes out and then the cartridge comes out. So when things are pretty dirty, it's because either the roller is dirty or there's a lot of residue so you vacuum. Okay, unplug it. Do not stick your hands in there when the power is on. But a lot of times when when things are printed uneven, you know, like light on one spot and then dark on another spot, on these laser printer, it's because it's using um, like an electrical charge to lay the print. So 
when the ink is running low or the ink particle is running low, it stops evenly laying. So what you do is you shake it. Okay. You make it even, you spread it by doing this. Okay. You put it back. And then it will go for a little bit. So give it a little bit more juice. Okay. And then on these, like these tends to be a little bit more expensive than what you see in the inkjet and the desk jet, where they are individual compartments. Now this one is only a black and white. On the very, I dealt with like huge HP, okay? Where they, they put super fine color, you know, for poster size and stuff like that. You see this at like staples and things. Um, you know, they use a different type of, so similar to this, but color, right? So you still have the, the cayenne, the yellow, and uh, the black. Okay, you insert it very similar to the best jet, but they're just different cartridges. So these are the cartridges. And then, um, you know, on the roller side, those tend to break a lot. Whenever the wheels get, get dirty or worn, right, you have to replace the wheel and the roller. So let's say that you're the IT technician, you're not, you don't have a certification in safety equipment, whatever. Call HP. Okay. Now the, the the HP has a thing with warranty. If you use anything that's not HP ink, the warranty. Okay. So you know a lot of companies go cheap with like the aftermarket ink or the refill ink. It goes to warranty. Okay. So spread the ink, put it back, back, and then do a test break trick. But you also should calibrate it. So when you calibrate it, it does, it checks all the, the if you use the inkjet or the desk jet, it does the nozzle and all of that, okay? So. What if, uh, what if you're dealing with a different type of printer? Let's say that the, you're using the RS scanner to reprint a label. Mm -hmm. yeah, the way different. You're using a thermal printer, I'm sure. So it uses heat to lay, right? It's like a receipt type or an invoice type. No, um, so like, or a dot matrix. Um, like a shoebox, you know how the shoebox and it has the label of the size? Uh-huh. Yeah, so those are thermal printer. Okay. Anytime that you see labels, receipts, um, they use heat to to inlay the 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 ink, yeah. right? And it uses a, a like a more glossy <laughs> paper. Okay. So those are pretty in general they're they're the mechanism is almost the same the book does a good job with talking about the 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 printers and stuff like that i think we're going to come back to the mechanical side um so when you go through the text it, it gives you all the component in general for most brands some brands are slightly different or what do you think is the reason why um let's say you want to reprint uh, a label scan scan the location of the printer but mm -hmm. it takes like 10 minutes to reprint. Why, why is there such a, is there a lag? Sometimes it prints it like that. Sometimes it takes 10, 10 minutes. It's network. It's control. Yeah. Network is slow. It's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. Because you, you're connecting to it. When you directly connecting to it, of course, it's always going to be fast. Also, it's not just their network. It's their print server too. So if you have a lot of people are printing at the same time, because it puts it onto a list right your your print queues and then it yeah, manages more, based uh, on that so they would have a, a print server that handles that a computer okay so yeah it's usually network based or server based that cause that problem latency bottleneck you know okay um so we are going to go into print and scanner you are going to look at the printer i know that they already installed the printer and then you are going to um find the printer. So our printer, and this is the PSC, I think I introduced this last time. You, you are gonna click on it, you're gonna click manage, okay? And then um, printer property, this is where you can share your printer, okay? So here we just simply share and you can name it anything you want or you can use the default name. Most of the time people would try to put like the manufacturer or the model, and then that, okay? Okay, so I went to the printer property, I went to sharing tab, 
And then I can also look at the port tab. And on the regular network, you're going to see that it's going to use an Ethernet connection, which refers to TCP IP. On a wireless network, it's going to use the Wi Fi connection. Um, so if you have a wireless printer at home, your ports is going to look a little different. Okay. So what port is used? You can just put Ethernet. And that is TCP IP. So most of the laser printer, they are, it's much faster for us to put it on an Ethernet port versus using Wi Fi, and it's safer too, that you can manage it better. Um, now, you know, you can use uh, any kind of system to manage your print really. You just have to set up the role for the print server, and all that is, is you can manage. You know, so let's say that I want to only allow uh, so many print, like 100 prints a day from a certain part of the network. I can also set that up with the print server, okay? I can also, you know, delete the print job that doesn't re meet the requirement. Like people printing out, you know, baseball schedule or something like that, the beds. Um, and you, you'd be surprised. So when I was the system admin, um, I used to have to to deal with like a lot of the the little stuff like you know people using internet on <laughs> for their own personal stuff. So we have to set firewall rules and block things. Um, there was software that we would use to track like the type of activities that they're doing on their computer um, and stuff like that. We caught somebody watching porn at work. However, that person was fired immediately. Um, I had a system where it notifies me. So, um, you know, and then we also track cookies. Um, everything, every website that you use now store cookies and it, we use a cookie analyzer. So it reads the content of the cookie and then, you know, so you can set rules. So security okay. side, you're gonna do a lot of that. You're gonna, you're gonna have to deal with like the dirty stuff, the good stuff and the bad stuff all at once. So, yeah. Let's say I go on internet, uh, I open up a tab, I go on Google, I type something, I go to the website, then I go back, I type something again, I go to another website, then I go back to Google, I type something again. Since I'm still in the same tab, am I using cookies all over the place within those websites? Uh, you, every time that you use and you allow them, now that they have to prompt you, whether you, they, you grant them to, 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 have a cookie on your system or not cookies just allowing you to quickly access that site again right so like you know you said the cookie analyzer mm -hmm. uh, would the analyzer be able to see all the websites you went to or the yeah so that's because i yeah way back in the day the high school teacher the computer operator who always can never go back it doesn't always, let you set it right they stop yeah go ahead so always uh exit off the tab and start a new one because um, i forgot what he said but he said to always take it out of the tab and create a new one to um, whenever you search the web. If you're going to use cookies or not. You can also edit your cookies and then fix that one and change them. You what can. If you, if you know how to do it. So, it, cookie is, is just a file that has information about that particular site. And so that way, when you revisit that site again, it's using that file. But, but vendor now uses the cookie to do what? to study your 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 click patterns your activities on the yeah so um yeah there's cookie poisoning there's a lot of things that that you can do with the cookie um i you know if it's just a site that i briefly need to check something i don't ever allow them to 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 by law they have to prompt you that they're they're storing you know you're storing cookie for their website um but before it just automatically saved, but yeah, you can always delete your cookies in your browser. So what happens if you don't accept or reject? Press X. Yeah. You, then sometimes they make it where you can't use other things. Okay. Right? okay. So once you set the time on that, take a screenshot, right? So what basically we're only commissioning this printer for eight to eight. Um, 
But if you wanted to make it always available, then yeah. So that's how they control resources um, in, in the environment for business. Or you can just limit it. Okay. And then if you have new driver, you can also add new driver. There's a lot of different things that you can control for this. But what this one I want to point out, I didn't write this into the step. So everyone is meaning everybody, right? Everybody in the world. So that's allowed to print. So you should also control the permissions of the people, especially if you share your printer at home or in a small business or in business in general, you can allow a certain group of people. Like here, I am MVC user, right? I'm able to do everything. And then administrator also, yeah. because MVC user okay. is the system admin as well as the role. But if yeah. you want, if you don't want them to start configuring your printer and stuff, right, put them into a group and we'll talk yes. about how to make users in group and then control the permission there. Okay. So a printer is an object. So your system sees it as a permission base compared to what we talked about is user rights and privileges that system based. So a printer is equivalent to like a file or a folder, which is an object in the system. So we're able to control it with the permission. So after you share, you should always go to the security tab and make sure that you control the permission there. And that's important. Okay. All right. And then I'm sure most of you did the you first one. No. No. It's a way to the market stuff. Why would they get they rid said of that they were going to get rid of them and replace them with their own like proprietary system, but no. it never worked out. No. <laughs> Blocks or whatever. Yeah. See, mine is not even getting there. Um, that's but. Right. I was uh, at the marketing a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember reading the textbook and it said, uh, yeah, uh, how some advertisers use USB devices to send advertising messages to uh, uh -huh. Android phones. That's Android phone doesn't take USB. You mean micro SD? Yeah, um, it said um like if um like by the device, and if, if a person with an Android if they have their Bluetooth on, and if they're within like twenty, like five miles within your radius, they're gonna receive that ad. No, crazy like. <laughs> no, some so, some stuff on the news is not always good news. I right? was on the textbook for the marketing. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, sometimes they give you a free USB. There might be advertisement on it, right? Or they might try to record some of the stuff, but that's illegal. If, if, if somebody, yeah, that's somebody, more about the cookies. somebody, about like if somebody give you a USB and they put something on there that recording your activities and things like that without showing like a, a disclaimer, that's illegal. That that that's a loss of waiting to happen they might have a disclaimer on a small print that you don't see but um that is very much a loss <laughs> so i'm just gonna fill this in as my thing never ended up so ntfs right we talked about that the total disk size you can also fill that out um by looking at this so 180 67 <laughs> and then I don't even know no, the bad sector. Know, you Did you get your, the result on yours? Or it never went? Anyone? For the first part, for the checklist? When I did it on mine, I have zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how much space is available on the disk? Let me check the other one. Uh, <laughs> what lower? On here on this one, it's um, 296. Use the big key. Okay, if you don't have the result like I do, you just take the screenshot of that it's pending because sometimes it doesn't go. On mine, it, on the other one, it didn't go, so I closed it. Okay, um, this one is no at the next startup. 
because OS is using Windows. Okay, yes. This is a very good computer. Testing one. Yeah. Would you see code coming? I would have to find that. Okay. So, any question? I think most of us are done. Okay. So, if you want to go with the rest, if your thing is still pending and it doesn't, it doesn't show, it doesn't do the checklist. Just take a screenshot of that, and include it. Okay. And then I'll just run this so you can see. Yeah. Same thing, right? The same as the check this out. Okay. So make sure. Oh, I, yeah. Sorry. I forgot I didn't take this off. Let me fix that for you real quick. Is that what you guys were waiting on? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I had um I had students do the practice lab one, but it's pretty lengthy and it's not really too relevant. There. So it should be working now. Okay. Start the assignment and then attach. And we're done for today. For this week actually. So make sure that we work on the company A plus, please. Um, and then as soon as I can get the voucher for you, I'll let you know. And then when they buy the voucher, then I'll give you the voucher code. Then you just, uh, when, when you're ready to take the actual test, you can just go to CompTIA website, put in your voucher code, and then you would just um, make an appointment at the test site. This room is actually one of the test sites. I'm working out some of the proctor to proctor the test. I know that CompTIA does do some virtual stuff um, through Pearson View, but you know. So when you're ready, I think the time that we'll buy the voucher until the time you use it, they usually give you a year. Um, but I encourage you to take it when your memory is still fresh with all of this material, okay? Now you don't have to sit for both parts. You can do the core one first and then come back to the core two. It's 90 minutes, 90 questions. It's not too long, an hour and a half of your life. And then as soon as you pass, it will email you the, the notification and then they will mail you in the mail to your home a card that you keep. But that code that they, and I think now they also do micro batching. So, um, you know, in the email, it should tell you whether you, you're certified or not. And then you just have to maintain it for three years. If you don't, you just have to retest in three years. Okay, so you have an option to do A plus for this class. Um, I think they did mention that they're gonna try to get the second one for, so, but you have to register in the apprenticeship program. I think I put that in the announcement. So one of my students informed me that the stuff that I just post in the announcement for uh, the Homeland Security one, the conference is booked, it's full, uh, mm -hmm. but you, you can still apply for it through the website, okay? So there are jobs, I guess, with the, the Homeland Security. Okay, you're done. Have a good night. Grab some snacks. I will see you next week. I have a meeting right before next Wednesday, so I should be here on time. But my five o'clock class is impacted. Safe. Today, I'm going to tonight. Get on it. Right? <laughs> Good night. Good night.